Hi, I'm Jesse Crawford, and I'm the author at Computer.Rip, or Computers Are Bad. Uh, this is going to be my first real shot at making a video. You know, I've given quite a few presentations before, including on historic topics uh, like this one, but almost always to a live audience. Of course, you know, with COVID, that hasn't been happening so much, so I'm trying something a little different here. Given the, you know, the, the format of a video, I'm going to try to make this a little more produced, a little higher quality, but it'll still be somewhat off the cuff. I'm not scripting this. I'm really just going to be trying to tell you what I know. Now, over at Computers Are Bad, the main thing that I talk about is computer history, but I've mentioned that uh, I have two other big interests, which are military history, especially during the Cold War, uh, and Cold War technological development, and also environmental remediation and uh, contamination. So this is a topic that's actually kind of at the intersection of all three of those. Uh, I know that I had said that the first video I was going to make was going to be about environmental remediation sites at Kirtland Air Force Base, but when I was researching that, I just kind of remembered how interested I am in this particular topic, and it just took me down a rabbit hole, and I decided I was going to talk about this instead. Don't worry, environmental remediation will come. So what exactly is this? Well, I'm going to be talking about EMP simulation facilities. And most of all, I'm going to be talking about Trestle, which is perhaps the, the most famous, certainly the largest, of the EMP simulation facilities uh, here in the Albuquerque area, and specifically at Kirtland Air Force Base. But before we get to Trestle, I just couldn't resist starting with this logo. But before we get to Trestle, let's kind of take a step back and talk a bit about what nuclear EMP is uh, and why the government, for a somewhat short period of time, became very interested in facilities which were capable of simulating nuclear EMPs. So to start, a little bit about nuclear EMPs themselves. There is, I believe, sort of a common historical misconception that the EMP effect of a nuclear detonation in the atmosphere was largely unknown until the Starfish Prime test. Now, that's not really true. Uh, the effect was expected by Manhattan Project physicists more or less from the beginning. There's some reporting that some of the physicists had actually done calculations prior to the Trinity test to try to estimate the size of the produced EMP. So it's not really that Starfish Prime was what led to the discovery of the nuclear EMP effect. But what did happen is that Starfish Prime uh, led to the discovery that first the effect was much larger than anticipated in the case of high altitude de uh, detonations, sorry, and second, the discovery that the EMP effect could have some significant military implications. So what do I mean by this? What was Starfish Prime? What happened? Well, Starfish Prime was the first high-altitude nuclear test uh, conducted by the United States. So this was a detonation of a nuclear weapon very high up in the atmosphere instead of somewhere on the surface, underground, or close to the surface. Uh, there's a few different reasons that the Starfish Prime test was conducted, but one of them was to establish the value of nuclear weapons uh, in having an effect over a very large area. So the Starfish Prime test was conducted roughly 900 miles uh, from Honolulu. As you can see from this sort of uh, photo collage, which uh, was in a newspaper at the time, the test was quite visible from Honolulu. People described it as almost bright as day. And that was expected. What was less expected was a series of strange effects that the nuclear detonation had on the Honolulu area. Uh, one of the big reported effects was burglar alarms going off, uh, but one that received a little more focus was a report that a large number of streetlights uh, actually went out in Honolulu directly, you know, immediately after the nuclear detonation and stayed out until they were repaired by utility crews. So that drew a lot of attention to um, this idea that a nuclear detonation 900 miles away could actually damage infrastructure in Honolulu wasn't something that was really foreseen prior to the test, and even after the test, the effect wasn't super well understood. Now, I'm not exactly intending to make this uh, entirely academically rigorous. I'm not quite going to provide a set of citations, but 
I do think that I will link to a set of papers that are, are good sources if you want to learn more about this. Um, frankly, because some of the sources on this are just really interesting reads on their own. If, if this is something you're interested in, I would definitely read the documents that I'll link to. One of those is a paper by, it's an internal report by a scientist at Sandia National Laboratories. It's titled, Did High Altitude EMP Cause the Hawaiian Streetlight Incident? A uh, very straightforward title. You know, they say that when the headline is a question, the answer is usually no, but in this case, uh, the author comes to the conclusion that the answer is yes. Uh, doing quite a bit of analysis, in fact, kind of an impressive amount of analysis, uh, he shows exactly how it is that the Starfish Prime EMP resulted in a set of 30 or so streetlight circuits in Honolulu being disabled until they were repaired. Uh, interesting read for the, frankly, for the history of streetlights as well. Um, but this whole thing kind of emphasized the point that the nuclear EMP effect could be something that mattered, right? If we can accidentally take streetlights out um, 900 miles away after a nuclear detonation, then imagine what we could do if we were intentionally using the EMP effect uh, as a weapon. So what exactly is the nuclear EMP effect? Well, the very short uh, explanation is that all nuclear detonations uh, produce a certain electromagnetic pulse. However, when the nuclear detonation is in the atmosphere, so surrounded by air, and especially when it's at high altitudes, that electromagnetic pulse effect is very strong. One of the things that was discovered uh, in the Starfish Prime test is that the field strength of the EMP was much greater than expected, uh, and it was much more horizontally polarized than expected. Now, I'm not really a physicist or an electrical engineer, so I'm, I'm going to try you know, not to go too far into depth on the RF physics components of this, because I'll probably be mostly wrong about whatever I say. Uh, but the, the general idea is that nuclear detonations were known to create a moderately strong vertically polarized electromagnetic pulse. Uh, what was discovered in the Starfish Prime test, though, is that that turns out to be the case when they are at or near the ground. When uh, nuclear detonations occur high in the atmosphere, they produce a much stronger electromagnetic pulse, which is horizontally polarized, which has some implications on the engineering later. This uh, figure actually comes out of the paper I just mentioned about Honolulu. It is an estimate. There weren't measurements in place. So this is an estimate of the strength of the electromagnetic pulse created by the Starfish Prime test at Honolulu. Now, there's a couple of things to note about this. The first thing to note is that the, uh, the field induced is a very strong field. Uh, in this case, at Honolulu, uh, 900 miles away, we're talking about... Uh, say 5.5 kilovolts uh, per meter uh, as an electromagnetic field, which is significant. Uh, another thing to note is that the duration of the pulse is very short. Um, the peak occurs at about 100 nanoseconds, and you know by 500 nanoseconds later, it has almost trailed off. There is a bit of a long trail, but the strong component of the pulse is very short. So why do these pulses happen? Well, uh, Nuclear electromagnetic pulses are generally kind of divided into three categories or three phases. You could think of them as three waves. They're called E1, E2, and E3. The really interesting one that we're kind of focusing on here is called the E1 pulse. The E1 pulse is a result of something called the Compton effect. Now, as I said, I'm not a physicist, but my general understanding of the Compton effect is that gamma rays, which are flying off of the nuclear detonation, uh, actually strike electrons in the surrounding air and bump them up to a higher energy level. And the cumulative result of that happening to a very large number of electrons very rapidly is a very strong induced electromagnetic field. And this all happens very quickly, because remember, this is the result of the initial gamma burst from the detonation, which is very short in duration. So it's very short-lived, and it's very strong, much like what we saw in that induced pulse at Honolulu. So that's the E1 component. The E2 component is a direct result of the gamma radiation spreading out from the weapon. Uh, the E2 component is also quite strong, but it moves more slowly, 
And the simple explanation, as I understand it, is that the E2 pulse is fairly similar to lightning in its electrical characteristics, so it's a little less uh, of an issue from a military perspective. Most infrastructure, telecoms equipment, and so on, lightning is already an issue they have to contend with. There's already protective measures in place. So the E2 pulse of a nuclear detonation is not likely to cause such severe damage. Another interesting uh, component is the E3 pulse. And I, actually, I think the E3 pulse is kind of my favorite just because it's sort of a cool concept. The E3 pulse is not really a pulse. It can last, uh, from what I've read, from 5 to 15 minutes. And it's, it's a much weaker effect, but it affects a larger area and over a longer duration. The E3 pulse is effectively an induced solar storm. What happens is that the cumulative effect of the E1 and the E2 pulses actually disrupts the Earth's magnetic field. And it kind of manipulates the magnetic field lines in the area of the detonation so that they start to carry that solar radiation down to the surface of the Earth. Uh, it's not such a strong effect, so you're really not going to notice it unless you have, you know, very long conductors like, say, power lines. But it is a concern because it lasts for a long time. So we're not talking about a nanosecond effect, we're talking about minutes, which means there's lots of time for a smaller field to still be able to do things like overheat transformers, which cause problems on a utility scale. So that's our E1, E2, and E3 pulse. Uh, and when it comes to what we're talking about here, which is kind of the military implications, the E1 pulse is the big focus. It's powerful, it's fast, uh, many things are not adequately protected against an E1 pulse by default, so there was a feeling that the E1 pulse could have significant military implications as something which multiplies the damage caused by a nuclear detonation. One of the reasons for that, uh, which you can kind of see on this figure, and, and we'll look at this figure as well, is that the area of effect of the E1 pulse uh, is potentially very large. You can see that a, a nuclear weapon detonated at an altitude of 300 miles can create an E1 pulse. This is out to a certain field strength. I want to say it's 5,000 uh, volts per meter, but I could be wrong. Uh, but basically, we're talking the entire United States uh, from just a single weapon. Now, that's not a super strong pulse. It's not necessarily going to cause a lot of damage but uh, it kind of shows you that this effect can occur over a very large area in the case of high-altitude nuclear detonations. And imagine if aircraft, especially, or other sorts of more sensitive equipment were impacted by that pulse. Uh, that could have some really severe implications on our ability to mount a reprisal to a nuclear strike. And that's kind of where the historical context here uh, comes in. In 1949, the National Security Council adopted nuclear deterrence as sort of the official policy of the United States on nuclear warfare. Uh, and, you know, essentially what I mean when I say nuclear deterrence is what came to be referred to as mutually assured destruction. Uh, the concept that our main asset in a, a potential nuclear war is our ability to reprise against an attack. Uh, what that means is that it's extremely important that our nuclear infrastructure be durable. If someone can launch a nuclear strike on the United States in such a way that they damage or eliminate our ability to mount a reprisal, then there's not really any deterrent to stop them from doing so. So when I say I'm interested in Cold War history, this is the, the single underlying element of most of the Cold War history that I'm interested in, is the need to harden and protect our military infrastructure, specifically our military infrastructure involved in the use of nuclear weapons, so that it could survive a potential nuclear onslaught by, say, the Soviet Union. So the Starfish Prime test really catapulted this nuclear EMP concern to front of mind as a potential impact of nuclear weapons. And the military became really interested in understanding this better, uh, especially from a defensive perspective. Given that, you know, we can produce these kinds of EMPs with nuclear weapons, and given as well that the Soviet Union knew that, uh, they had performed similar high-altitude tests right around the same time frame, how can we modify or enhance our military assets so that they are unlikely to be damaged or disrupted by that EMP? Well, starting pretty much immediately after the Starfish Prime test in the early 60s, we, you know, kind of initiated several programs to test that in a very direct measure. We had already, by this point, been doing things like detonating nuclear weapons in proximity to uh, naval vessels and aircraft, uh, 
uh, armored vehicles, etc., in order to understand the impact that they had. And, you know, you might think that we would have just continued on that route, even for as many problems as it had, uh, including the, the hazard to human health and safety, which was not insignificant. But shortly after 1962, you know, something happened that changed the course of nuclear testing a bit, and that was the 1963 Limited Test Ban Treaty. So the Limited Test Ban Treaty was uh, essentially an agreement between the United States and the Soviet Union that eliminated all nuclear testing that was not underground. So all nuclear testing in the atmosphere was banned. And that's pretty tricky from an EMP perspective. Because un underground nuclear detonations, number one, they produce a far smaller electromagnetic pulse. Uh, number two, it's very difficult to expose things to that electromagnetic pulse because, you know, you'd have to bury them or it just gets really difficult. You can't effectively test hardening against electromagnetic pulse effects using an underground military test. So this created the situation where we needed uh, a capability to produce simulated EMPs. Now, the term simulated EMP there is a little bit weird because the devices we're going to be talking about, the EMPs they produce are very real, not simulated at all. Uh, they're simulated in that they're not the result of a nuclear detonation, but instead an artificially created EMP by electrical means that is intended to be uh, similar or to produce a field which is similar to that which a piece of equipment would be exposed to in the case of a high altitude uh, nuclear detonation. So how do we get to having EMP simulators on the ground and why is it that I said that this is closely related to Kirtland Air Force Base? Well, for a very long time, uh, basically since the mid stages of the Manhattan Project, there had been a strong nexus between Kirtland Air Force Base uh, and the nuclear weapons program. There's a few different reasons for that, uh, but it was basically just a concentration of facilities. Uh, Z Division of the Los Alamos Scientific Laboratory, of course, was located at Kirtland Air Force Base. Z Division would later become Sandia National Laboratories, which is still there uh, today. Um, but besides the Department of Energy, you know, what would become the Department of Energy complex, uh, the Air Force had its Air Force Special Weapons Center uh, located at Kirtland Air Force Base. So it was effectively also the headquarters of Air Force nuclear weapons programs. And there was also a Defense Nuclear Weapons Board located there, which handled the coordinating between different sections of the armed forces. So Kirtland Air Force Base, um, you know, since 1950 has been just a huge uh, locus of nuclear weapons activity. One of the components of that was something called the Air Force Special Weapons Center, which was uh, especially kind of the, the decision-making and strategic arm of Air Force use of nuclear weapons. And the Air Force Special Weapons Center in 1963 established the Air Force Special Weapons Laboratory. And the Air Force Special Weapons Laboratory uh, very clearly directly came out of the needs uh, that came from the Limited Test Ban Treaty. The Air Force Special Weapons Laboratory basically had a commission to work on two things. The first thing was simulation of and defense against nuclear electromagnetic pulses which is what we're going to be talking about here. And the second uh, commission that they had, it's, this is kind of interesting, it seems a little unrelated, but the second commission of the Air Force Special Weapons Laboratory was actually to investigate the use of lasers uh, as a method of intercepting and destroying uh, missiles. That function, of course, uh, persists to this day at Kirtland Air Force Base uh, in the form of the directed energy weapons uh, work done there, which is now done by the Air Force Research Lab, which sort of uh, assumed many of these roles. But the thing we're going to be focusing on is that the Air Force Special Weapons Center was the Air Force headquarters for research into this electromagnetic pulse concern, and as a result, almost all of the EMP simulators that the Air Force and more broadly the United States military constructed were directly at Kirtland Air Force Base. In fact, it became kind of amusingly crowded with these facilities, especially considering the safety implications. So all that said, let's, uh, let's start talking about some EMP simulators. Just to give us a starting point, I wanted to take a look at a, a photograph of uh, what would become Kirtland Air Force Base. Uh, this is a, actually a 1951 aerial photograph. I got this from the USGS, as you can see from the upside-down logo at the top. 
uh, part of their excellent collection of historical aerial imagery of the United States. Uh, there's a couple things about this image I just want to point out before you get too um, sort of confused by or interested in them. It's got these uh, kind of uh, artifacts on the side. First couple times I saw these, I actually thought that they might have been some sort of censorship, like back at the time they were blocking out certain military facilities in these photos. Uh, it's, it's not. I actually, I think there's some kind of tape that was used as part of the digitizing process for these uh, slides when they were damaged. Because when you look at the 1950s era aerials, they just have these white blocks in the middle of nowhere. So I, the point is, I wouldn't really pay too, too, much, too much attention to those. I don't think they really mean anything. And what I would pay attention to is uh, this whole complex here, which, of course, today is the Albuquerque International Sunport. At this point in time, in 1951, uh, it had not become... Uh, Kirtland Air Force Base exactly yet, but it, it would be later. Uh, there's a few things that are different about the whole airfield uh, now from the way things were back then that will come to matter a little bit, so I just want to point out to you a couple things. If, if you happen to be familiar with the Sunport for some reason, um, you might be surprised to know that at the time this photo was taken, and for the entire period that we'll be discussing, the control tower was located uh, roughly here, somewhere in that box. Uh, you can't quite make it out in this photo. Uh, <laughs> keep that in mind later, because that becomes kind of a, a funny issue with some of these EMP simulators. Uh, and, uh, another thing you might not know if you're used to the area now is that while the area on the left would become Kirtland Air Force Base, the area on the right of that dividing line, roughly speaking, was Sandia Army Base, which is where Z Division was located. Actually had its own airfield, which is sort of funny. They were kind of right next to each other. But uh, this is kind of the world we'll be talking about, is the airfield and then an extensive area to the right and to the south of it, which were at the time an Army installation uh, and are today all part of Kirtland Air Force Base. The first... EMP simulator, which the Air Force Special Weapons Laboratory began work on, at least the first large-scale simulator, was something which is called ALEX. Now, throughout this video, uh, I'm going to give some acronyms that I am not going to explain. And, you know, if you're familiar with, with military, with the military and with military research projects, you might immediately understand why I'm generally not bothering to tell you what the acronyms stand for. But just to give you the flavor uh, of the issue, let me tell you what ALEX stands for. ALEX, of course, is an abbreviation for Air Force Weapons Laboratory and Los Alamos Scientific Laboratory Electromagnetic Pulse Calibration and Simulation Facility. I'm not going to say that again. We'll just be saying ALEX. Uh, so ALEX, as the name suggests, was sort of a joint venture between the Air Force Weapons Laboratory and Los Alamos Scientific Laboratory, which today is Los Alamos National Laboratory. Uh, part of the construction was done by uh, defense contractor EG&G, which is now part of URS. EG&G was, you know, at the time, almost every big military project, it seems, was being done by EG&G. They were heavily involved in the operations of Los Alamos Scientific Laboratory as well. Uh, and Alex, designing Alex was a huge effort. Uh, a huge amount of new ground was being broken. Uh, building devices that could create very strong electromagnetic pulse uh, fields w was just not really something that had been done before. So Alex being kind of the first large-scale simulator that achieved uh, a good operational state really kind of became a template for many simulators that followed. Uh, these EMP simulators, we could broadly divide into sort of a few different categories. Uh, in this categorization, which we'll kind of talk about more as we go on, we might call Alex a vertically polarized and uh, confined field simulator. So what we mean by vertically polarized is that the polarization of the electromagnetic field produced is vertical through the test volume. And what we mean by confined is that the, the full field produced by the simulator is contained within a roughly rectangular prism. And of course, this is really uh, stretching my drawing skills. Uh, 
but that is roughly the test volume of Alex. Alex, we could call a plate type simulator, and uh, basically what that means is uh, that there are two plates. There is a top plate, which is this surface, and there's a bottom plate, which is that surface, and a very strong difference in potential is rapidly applied to those two plates, which is what results in an extremely strong electromagnetic field between them. So this is kind of like the interior of a capacitor, sort of, but on a very large physical scale. When I say plate, they weren't exactly plates. Uh, the designers of these simulators were really only interested in the low frequency components of the pulse, or the relatively low frequency components of the pulse, which meant that for their purposes, a metal mesh was basically as good as a plate, but much lighter weight. And so that's what it used. There was a metal mesh uh, basically suspended between poles above the test volume, and then a metal mesh or a ground plane, which was embedded in the pavement below the test volume. Now, when I say we take two plates and we apply a very strong uh, potential difference to the two of them, I make that sound pretty easy. Uh, in practice, of course, the kinds of potential differences which we're trying to create, which are in the mini of megavolts, uh, are, are rather difficult to produce. So there is a building which is just marked source generator on this drawing. Inside the source generator are devices called pulsers, and we'll talk a little bit more about them in a moment, but for now we'll just say that the pulsers produce an extremely high potential and extremely high voltage for a very short period of time. The, uh, the potential which is created by the pulsers is so great that it has to be handled kind of carefully. Uh, a lot of electromagnetic effects start mattering. It starts to have a tendency to corona and then arc to the ground or other surfaces. Uh, you just have to be very particular about the way you handle that pulse, which means that in these types of simulators, it's usually routed in sort of a gentle conical way away from the pulse generators. And that's where we can kind of see these two lines, which form sort of a, a gradual conical pattern from the pulsers to the top plate of the test volume, and then finally away to the termination. And the reason for the termination, if you've done like uh, networking and data communication stuff, this will make sense to you. It's just we're talking about way higher uh, amplitudes than usual. Uh, if they just kind of had the wires end, then the generated pulse would go across the simulator and it would bounce off the far side and then it would bounce back and forth and it, it would create a longer pulse than desired. It would probably also damage the pulsers and it would be a big problem. So the termination is basically a huge resistor, which is at the far end of the simulator from the pulse generators. And all it does is it actually absorbs the potential produced during the pulse so that it just stops at the terminator and doesn't go back and forth and becomes some kind of big problem. A couple other details of the general design of Alex. Uh, this object over here is a gantry crane. Uh, that was used to be able to position objects in the test volume. Um, and we'll look at it in a minute at Alex kind of in sight, which will give you a better idea of the scale. The test volume uh, on it is about 40 feet wide. Uh, and then on the other side, we have something labeled access ramp. A very common design trait of these EMP simulators is that a lot of the mechanics are underground. Uh, a lot of the control and, and kind of uh, functional components of these simulators need to be put somewhere where they're shielded from the pulse so that the simulator won't damage itself. Because there's a ground plane below the test volume and, you know, obviously underground, it's a nice confined space, often the equipment gets placed underground below the test volume where it's shielded by the ground plane and where it's fairly easy to add a lot of additional shielding. So a common trait of these EMP simulators is that you'll see a ramp disappearing into the ground. Before we look at uh, sort of Alex in place, let's just talk a little bit more about the pulsers. Um, this is a photo of a couple of pulsers. These aren't actually the pulsers for Alex, they're for a later simulator, but it's one of the only actual photos I could find of pulsers, and it's still not a very good photo. The basic idea of the pulsar in most EMP simulators is that it is a very large Marx generator. Now, to put it simply, 
A Marx generator is an arrangement where you charge a whole bunch of capacitors in parallel, and then you reconnect them in series. So you say you charge 100 capacitors at uh, 20 volts, you reconnect them in series instead of parallel, now you have 2,000 volts of potential produced by the capacitors. And most of these pulsers, uh, more specifically, used a multi-stage Marx generator. So they repeated this process. They used a Marx generator to charge another Marx generator to charge another Marx generator through up to 90 stages, although roughly 40 stages seem to be more common. At the end of all these Marx generators, uh, remember that nuclear EMPs have a very short duration, and that's one of the characteristics that they really needed to reproduce that was kind of tricky to reproduce. So at the end of the Marx generator, to help control the, the duration of the output and its rise and fall times, they would use a device called a gas switch. And all a gas really is, is a volume, uh, an enclosed tank that has two kind of contacts in it. And it is flooded with a gas with a, a well-controlled and high uh, dielectric or breakdown strength. Uh, often a uh, sulfur compound was used. Uh, what happens in the gas switch is that once the potential between the two plates or contacts reaches a certain point, it will arc through the gas. Uh, and because a pressurized, calibrated gas is used, uh, the designers can control quite well what voltage that breakdown occurs at. And very often the gas switch is adjustable, so they can change the distance between the two plates, which allows you know, control of the voltage at which it breaks down. So, very simple explanation of a pulsar, most of the time is a long multi-stage Marx generator connected to a gas switch, and usually this whole thing is immersed in oil. Because the potential produced in the Marx generators is so great, you'd have problems with it arcing through air and uh, oil. You can use an oil that presents a very high uh, dielectric strength, so that kind of prevents having all kinds of arcing problems and having it look like some sort of movie uh, mad science experiment whenever it fires. Well, this is sort of a more period uh, aerial photograph. This was taken in 1967, which was, as far as I can tell, the same year that Alex became active. Now, this is a good point to uh, kind of clarify that research on these simulators is not easy. There is not a lot of information overall about these simulators out there. Much of the material uh, on them when they were built was classified and... Uh, even if it still exists in archives, once classified material can be very difficult to drag up because you're, you know, you're trying to file FOIA requests when you don't even know what you're filing requests about. So there's not a ton out here. I was getting pretty frustrated at not being able to find more details on these, and I, I felt a little better when I was reading uh, a history of one of these simulators, which was actually commissioned by the Air Force from a professional historian, and you know she could she couldn't answer some basic questions about these either. So necessarily there's some uncertainty in uh, some of these dates and details, but I believe Alex reached its first operational capability in 1967, and this photo was taken in 1967, so it was probably either brand new or almost finished at the time. Alex is located right here. Um, if you look real close, you might be able to kind of make out the footprint. To avoid making you strain your eyes too much, though, I'm going to actually drop out of this presentation because these uh, old aerial photos are very large uh, TIFF files, and PowerPoint really doesn't handle them well. It's kind of hard to find software in general that handles, you know, 100 megabyte TIFF files well. And it's sort of a funny thing that Windows Photo Viewer, the old one, is just one of the few things out there that actually just seems fine with... Uh, TIFF files in excess of a gigabyte I've opened in this photo viewer without too much trouble. So here in this 1967 aerial photo is Alex. Uh, we talked about earlier the uh, kind of outline of Alex. Uh, you can kind of see the test volume there is located in the center. There's sort of a diamond-shaped concrete surround. And on the northeast end, we have the pulse generator. On the southwest end, we have the terminator. And uh, to the southeast, uh, we have the ramp down to the underground space. Some interesting things to note about Alex. Uh, it's located in this kind of rectangular uh, plot of land, which I actually, I originally thought that had been built 
uh, for Alex, but I later realized in older aerial photos, that whole thing is there. They just added Alex in the middle of it. Um, the other buildings in that area have been there since the 50s, at least, so I'm, I'm not even totally sure what uh, the purpose of the rest of that area was at the time. But notice that it's pretty close to the flight line, uh, and specifically to a taxiway, um, which I want to say is Taxiway Echo. I should really be able to say that more confidently, but this was before they changed a lot about the airport, and I'm a little less certain of what I'm looking at here. Uh, at the time, they did not have the ability to taxi aircraft directly to Alex, and I don't believe they ever gained that ability. But I mentioned aircraft were a big concern, so the fact that they're building Alex right next to an airfield without the ability to get aircraft to it is uh, portentous of some of the later developments that uh, will occur. Alex uh, could produce a field of roughly 6 kilovolts per meter uh, as a short-lasted pulse. Um, you might remember that's about comparable to what Honolulu experienced uh, after the Starfish Prime test. So given its capabilities, what was Alex used for? Well, the test volume of Alex was fairly small. It wasn't suitable for aircraft, wasn't necessarily suitable for large vehicles. Much of what it was used for was actually missile systems. Uh, and there was a strong need to test them. Obviously, if uh, intercontinental ballistic missiles could be disabled by an EMP, then that would become a very attractive option for, say, the Soviet Union to disrupt a deterrence in progress. Uh, but, you know, the Air Force uh, Special Weapons Lab sort of used the ALEX capability to expand the gamut of what these EMP simulators could be used for. And this is an example that came out of a report that I thought was sort of funny, uh, they launched a program with Alex to investigate how well existing sort of civilian uh, critical infrastructure would be able to survive uh, a nuclear EMP. And in this case, with how terrible this copy of this photograph is, you can, of course, just make out that this appears to be a Southwestern Bell uh, service truck. In general, they wanted to know whether or not two-way radios would survive uh, a nuclear EMP. So, you know, they, they tested this uh, Bell service truck, which would have had a two-way radio. I know they also uh, actually took the fire chief's uh, truck from the Albuquerque Fire Department and subjected it to an EMP, once again, to see whether or not the radio uh, in it would tolerate the effects of the nuclear EMP. So after Alex, uh, what was next? Well, Alex was, for most purposes, uh, a very well-functioning simulator. It met a lot of the design goals of being able to produce uh, a strong field in an enclosed volume. But as with many things in the Cold War, there was a desire to uh, have a bigger and stronger capability. And a lot of that was because, you know, as I said, Alex could only be used for smaller vehicles, and the field strength uh, was only... Uh, about 6 kilovolts per meter, which was much lower than the worst case that could be encountered. The next EMP simulator, uh, constructed by the Air Force Special Weapons Laboratory, uh, was built as a partnership with EG&G directly, uh, and it was called ARIES, or the Advanced Research Electromagnetic Simulator. Now, ARIES was really kind of Alex 2.0. Uh, it was the exact same type of simulator, uh, being a vertically polarized plate-type confined field simulator. Uh, very similar design, but it had a larger test volume and was capable of a peak field strength of 93 kilovolts per meter, uh, which is a, a really huge, uh, or a really strong field. Um, that's similar to what would be encountered, uh, say, on the ground directly below uh, one of these atmospheric detonations. So where was Ares? Well, I mentioned before that it might be interesting to know that the control tower of the Sunport uh, at this point in time was located down in this sort of region. Uh, and as you can see, Ares was quite close. Uh, it was <clears throat> something like 400 meters distant from the control tower. Uh, you might think that it seems like a bad idea to build a, a very powerful EMP simulator in close proximity to the control tower of an active airfield. And uh, while well, the Air Force Special Weapons Lab didn't seem to agree to the extent you might imagine, but because Ares was capable of producing such a strong field, it did seem smart to build it further away, and they needed more space anyway. So let's take a look uh, at 
uh, an overhead photograph of a little different part of the airfield, which is further to the east. So we're just off to the east of where we were looking before. So let's take a look at Ares. <clears throat> this aerial photo was taken in 1990, so it's not too contemporaneous to the completion of Ares in the late 1960s, uh, but it's one of the best photos I could find that clearly depicts Ares uh, in its sort of functional state. So where are we looking at? We're off to the east of the photo that we were looking at before. So you can see here is the end of uh, runway 8, or I should probably actually say the beginning of runway 26, uh, the furthest east extent of the airport, which is the exact same place that you find it today. And up in this area, sort of the northeast corner, uh, is uh, what we now know as Sandia National Laboratories. And it was Sandia uh, by this point in time, although I don't think it was quite, I think it was still called Sandia Laboratory without the national. In the middle of this photo, we see some interesting structures. And one of those is a bit of a spoiler. We'll be talking about it later. But right here, we see Aries. Now, you can't make it out here quite as well as you should be able to. I, I have to say, I've been having an amazingly hard time uh, finding a good tool for annotating on screen these 100 megabyte TIFFs. So if you know of a great solution, let me know. But most software uh, just chokes on them. This is actually a JPEG version of, of this TIFF file open in Microsoft Whiteboard, which is weirdly buggy when you're using tablet input, even though that seems like what it's for, etc. I'll try not to just complain too much. Let's look at how Ares is actually built. The test volume is right here. And you can see the four towers, uh, which serve as the support structure for the upper plate. And the bottom plate, of course, is embedded in the ground as a ground plane. The pulsar is located off to the west side. So the diamond shape that we saw with Alex is also present here with the pulsar on this end and the ground plane on this end. And Ares received pretty heavy use in the testing of weapons systems, especially uh, missiles, but also some things like armored vehicles, and uh, I believe even some small aircraft, although I'm having a hard time finding uh, good documentation on that. Ares is still one of the older facilities uh, of the ones that I'll be discussing, but it was one of the highest field strengths that these facilities were capable of producing. Uh, probably really taking advantage of the fact that Alex basically served as a prototype for Ares. So this design uh, was quite well refined by the time that uh, Ares was built. Now I mentioned earlier that there are a few different basic types of EMP simulators, and Alex and Ares are both examples of vertically polarized uh, plate type or confined field simulators. Now all along, there had been a strong desire to test aircraft. Aircraft were always one of the greatest concerns when it came to nuclear EMP. But the problem with aircraft is that they're also quite large, especially the type of aircraft which were really the greatest concern in a nuclear reprisal situation, uh, which were specifically bombers like the B-52. It was not seen as practical uh, at this point in time in the late 60s, early 70s, to construct a plate-type simulator that an aircraft could be placed inside of. So this led to the design of a vertically polarized, unconfined type simulator, which is based on a dipole antenna. So a plate-type simulator we could think of as sort of being a really huge capacitor, with two different plates and you place the object under test in between. A uh, dipole simulator is more like a very overpowered radio transmitter. Uh, an antenna of sorts is constructed, it sort of broadcasts the field in all directions, and the object under test is simply placed sufficiently near it. This is a diagram of the antenna for the first vertically polarized dipole or VPD EMP simulator constructed which is somewhat uncreatively named VPD-1. 
Now, if you've done radio work before, uh, this might be somewhat uh, familiar to you and sort of a cobweb type antenna. The pulsars are located in the base in this enclosure. Uh, and I say they're in that enclosure. The pulsars for these are generally actually underground, uh, organized something like there's a chamber down here which has the pulsar uh, cascade inside of it. This little hut at the bottom is a gas vessel, a pressurized gas vessel, which contains the gas switch. And when the gas switch arcs through, the pulse is released into the antenna, which is this sort of conical object. Ideally, the antenna would be an exact cone. In this case, it's curved. You know, this is where the limit of my RF physics knowledge uh, hits, but my understanding is that it was actually curved as a form of impedance matching. So there's something like a network of resistors placed around the edge uh, at these positions, and that combined with the curved shape of the antenna gives a better coupling to the ground plane, the other side of the dipole, which in this case is literally the ground. So once again, there's a metal mesh ground plane which is buried, but it's just buried across a wide area surrounding uh, this dipole antenna. So where was VPD-1? Well, for the construction of VPD-1, they sort of returned to their roots over just south of the airfield, very near Alex. This is actually VPD-1 right here. Uh, specifically, we have a ramp on which an aircraft can be placed, and then the antenna. It's a little hard to see in this photo, but it's right there next to the ramp. So there's nothing like Alex or Ares where we are containing an object inside of the simulator. Instead, we're basically just placing the object under test next to the simulator. And this is kind of a cool photo because you can see that there actually is an aircraft on the ramp in this photo. Now, this photo is 1990. I... I really don't know. I haven't been able to find an answer on when VPD was decommissioned, but I would have thought that it would be out of use by 1990. So I have a suspicion that that aircraft may just be parked there. It may not actually be, uh, you know, an experimental use of VPD. Now, when we talked about uh, Alex, we talked about Alex having the problem of being located uncomfortably near the control tower, which is really hard to see. Uh, in the, oh, it's not actually that hard to see in this photo at all. I think I've been marking it too far to the south. The control tower is right here. Uh, in this photo, you can actually make out uh, the tower on top of that building by its shadow. VPD was especially close to the control tower. It produced an unconfined field, and it was also uncomfortably close to these two ramp areas uh, on Taxiway Hotel, which uh, were used at the time, and I believe are still used today for arm, de-arm, and weapons loading. So the idea of having your EMP simulator right next to where you're handling the bombs, you know, it just doesn't seem like the finest. So much like Alex, uh, VPD received an upgrade to the creatively named VPD-2. Uh, and VPD-2, very similarly to Ares, was placed further away. So going back to our 1990 aerial photo, which, you know, once again, really just provides the clearest view of these, VPD-2 looks a lot like VPD-1, uh, except for located further away off to the east end of the airstrip. The antenna is right here, very similar design of a conical antenna with a gas switch enclosed in a pressure chamber in the center and the actual Marx uh, generator pulse generator system located underground. Next to it is a concrete uh, pad or a concrete ramp. Uh, somewhat surprisingly, this actually is connected to the airfield just by a long and somewhat circuitous taxiway which you can see runs off that way to around the threshold. In fact, I think when VPD-2 was originally constructed directly to the threshold of runway 26. So they had the ability to taxi an aircraft all the way over here, uh, conduct the vertical pol vertically polarized test on it, uh, and all of this was occurring far enough away from the flight line, the control tower, other aircraft, that it hopefully involved a lower level of risk uh, than VPD-1. My assumption is that VPD-2 was also more powerful. Uh, the antenna is larger, 
Uh, I honestly have not been able to figure that out. VPD-1 was capable of producing a, a field of 4 kilovolts per meter, which is not really that large. So VPD-2, I'm just not sure, probably more than that. Uh, an interesting note about both Alex and VPD-1 as well, uh, when VPD-2 and Ares were built, they didn't abandon Alex and VPD-1. In fact, they kind of upgraded them so that they'd be suitable for use for a little different form of testing, which is continuous wave or CW testing. Uh, a pulse is useful for simulating nuclear conditions, but if you're trying to evaluate the hardening of, say, an aircraft or a missile system, especially if you maybe have something that you've already tested, you did hardening, now you just want to check if there's any repairs or modifications needed, having to conduct repeated pulses with uh, instrumentation set up in different places is a real pain. So, uh, Alex and VPD-1 were both fitted with the capability to just produce a continuous, strong electromagnetic field. Um, nowhere near the strength of the pulsed capability, but strong enough that they could use field meters uh, inside of an aircraft to just uh, sort of turn the simulator on and then move a field meter around, check for any leaks basically in the hardening without having to do a very complicated process of setting up repeated pulses. So we've talked a lot about these vertically polarized EMP simulators. We've seen a plate type or confined vertically polarized uh, EMP simulator as well as an unconfined dipole type one. But, as I mentioned earlier, in a high-altitude nuclear EMP, usually the horizontally polarized field strength is actually greater. So, it's obviously desirable to be able to test using a horizontally polarized field. It was just somewhat more difficult to produce a horizontally polarized field. In the early 70s, work started on the first substantial horizontally polarized EMP simulator, uh, it was of the dipole type, similar to VPD, and so it was creatively named HPD, for Horizontally Polarized Dipole. And here's a drawing uh, of what HPD looked like. HPD was uh, once again built by EG&G for the Air Force Special Weapons Laboratory. It was not the first uh, horizontally polarized dipole simulator to be constructed, but it was quite a bit bigger than any before it. Uh, so they were expanding on, on sort of a known design, which is, I'll be honest, rather eccentric looking. Uh, this structure is actually the antenna, and that's kind of a, a loose bundle of wires suspended between guides hanging from towers so that you can park the object under test under it. And the pulse generator is actually in the middle. Uh, so it's suspended above the whole thing. Now, I read that the first of these horizontally polarized dipoles that was constructed, which was not at Kirtland Air Force Base, but be somewhere in the eastern United States, actually used a battery-powered um, pulse generator at the top, which had the real complication that between tests they had to lower it in order to replace the batteries. Um, HPD, uh, the HPD built at Kirtland used a somewhat complex uh, design to provide a power feed to the simulator or to the pulse generator uh, when it was up there in use, so it was much easier to operate. This is sort of an expanded drawing of what that pulse generator actually looked like. I don't know a lot about the internal architecture uh, of this device. I do believe it, it was based on Marx generators, uh, much like the others. Um, but uh, clearly it was, you know, sufficiently lightweight that it could be suspended from these structures. More than one uh, horizontally polarized dipole simulator was built using a similar, a similar design. Some of them got a little weird and exotic. There was one which was called ARC, which they had this whole idea where they were going to actually suspend the antenna from a lighter-than-air balloon. You know, that worked about as well as you can imagine, and they ended up changing the design to using towers to support it. But there was a lot of uh, kind of iteration and innovation that was happening on this rough idea. HPD was built as part of the same program as VPD-2, and so it was in essentially the same location. This is HPD right here. You can see the support towers and the antenna fit in an arc over the facility. Uh, somewhat like that. 
You can see that it also has a ramp below it, similarly connected via taxiway directly to the VPD-2 ramp so that it was possible to come park an aircraft underneath. Many of these objects that you see in this area and in this area are instrumentation trailers and buildings which were used for data collection uh, on the experiments which were conducted using these two simulators. And we'll see later that on the large part uh, these structures remain today, although the antenna for HPD is long since gone. The HPD uh, was capable of producing a field of 25 kilovolts per meter, so it was quite substantial, especially for a dipole-type simulator, uh, and it was successful to the degree that the general design was repeated in a number of cases. Uh, in fact, a similar second facility was built over at the same pad as VPD-1, which was called Suspended RES. It was much smaller uh, the name is, is worth noting, though. It was called Suspended RES because it was an RES uh, hung from poles. RES was actually a horizontal dipole-type simulator, which was intended to be suspended below a helicopter. Uh, and they just sort of installed a, a permanent one over the VPD-1 pad to use for smaller-scale experiments. Now, before we finally loop back to the start of the presentation, and talk about the crown jewel of EMP simulators, I would assert not just at Kirtland Air Force Base, but globally, I want to mention that there are at least two, or I should say were, at least two additional EMP simulation facilities at Kirtland Air Force Base that I'm not mentioning in this presentation. And that's because I could find virtually no information about them. Those were HIS-1, a horizontally polarized simulator that I know almost nothing about other than that it also shared a ramp with VPD-1, and the Sandia Long Wire facility, which was owned and operated by Sandia National Laboratories and was capable of a 400 volt per meter field strength. So that's not particularly strong at all. It was used for low level testing of nuclear weapon components, uh, I believe, and I have not been able to determine where it was located. So, with those two uh, sort of mystery simulators out of the way, let's finally move on to Trestle. Trestle was a long-standing, at least decade-long, and particularly ambitious program. Trestle seems to have been first conceptualized in 1969, and it didn't reach an operational capability until 1980. So the design and construction of Trestle actually spans nearly the entire history of all of the other EMP simulators that I just spoke of. The greatest military risk associated with nuclear EMP was believed to be two aircraft from a horizontally polarized EMP. Most, or really all, of the simulators that we've just discussed were located on the ground. In fact, all EMP simulators had been located on the ground, with the exception of RES and a couple of other more minor designs that could be suspended from aircraft. We could build these simulators large enough to test aircraft, uh, as was the case with both VPD-2 and HPD, but there was sort of a basic problem that the object under test was on the ground, and the presence of the ground significantly affected the nature of the field. There was a desire to be able to test aircraft not just in an on-the-ground condition, but also in the true conditions that they would experience in flight. In a way, it might seem a bit far-fetched that an aircraft would encounter an in-flight nuclear EMP, but it was actually seen as quite likely, and that was for two reasons. First, if we attempted to deliver nuclear weapons to, say, the Soviet Union using bomber aircraft, then the Soviet Union might make use of a nuclear weapon detonated near those aircraft to effectively knock them out of the air using the EMP effect. Second, the United States uh, by this point was operating the Looking Glass program, through which there was an airborne command post in the air at all times uh, in order to launch a nuclear reprisal should the ground-based command facilities be compromised. Uh, obviously, it was desirable that that airborne command post be able to survive the effects of a nuclear attack on the United States below them. Uh, so, this effect on aircraft in flight was actually of great concern. Building a simulator which could be carried by an aircraft uh, 
that was also capable of producing uh, field strengths comparable to those of a nearby nuclear detonation was simply not seen as practical. The simulator would have to be too large and heavy, and uh, because we could only seem to produce extremely strong fields using plate type or confined simulators, uh, it, it was just too difficult to work out mechanically. It's very hard to take an aircraft that is in flight and then put something around it. So instead, from a pretty early stage, people theorized that you might be able to take an aircraft and simply lift it off the ground sufficiently that the ground no longer had a substantial impact on the field. To do so, you would have to lift it off the ground using something which was not metallic so that it would not interact with the electromagnetic field. One of the uh, proposers of such a design compared it to a railroad trestle, uh, since it would have to be presumably a wooden structure, and the name trestle uh, stuck. While the ultimate simulator was more officially named Atlas I, the name trestle was widely used to refer to it. This is a 1971 illustration of what such a simulator might look like and we can already see the basic form of the idea taking place. We have an aircraft which is parked on a platform, which is constructed of some sort, presumably wood, some sort of dielectric material, uh, and it has a plate-type EMP simulator constructed around it, suspended from poles. You'll notice here that they made use of a natural cliff so that they didn't have to excavate an enormous hole. Uh, that was basically a measure to save on construction costs for the simulator. After the decision was made in the early 70s to go forward with building such a facility, uh, there was a considerable effort to locate possible sites. And that was a nationwide search. The Air Force Special Weapons Laboratory was sponsoring this project, but they didn't uh, confine their consideration to Kirtland Air Force Base. That said, there were three finalist locations selected at Kirtland, all taking advantage of the Teharis Arroyo. The Teharis Arroyo is a natural depression that we can see draining stormwater from Teharis Canyon along roughly this route. And there are fairly substantial uh, escarpments on both the north and south of the Teharis Arroyo. The three candidate positions which were considered were roughly here, here, and here, next to Ares. You can see that these two on the west side have almost the exact same problems as VPD and Alex as far as being located very close to the airfield. And for that reason, the eastmost candidate location was selected and uh, design proceeded given that location. Trestle was awarded as what we would now call a design build contract, although the term wasn't really in use at the time, to the McDonnell Douglas Aircraft Company, who committed to the entire process, uh, really from conceptualization to the commissioning and operations of the simulator. Early on, what was proposed by McDonnell Douglas looked something like this. It was actually two facilities. Now, it's funny to notice uh, that this was likely, this illustration was likely done before the completion of Ares, because the further right of these two facilities is actually located almost exactly right where Ares is. Uh, one of the two simulators would be vertically polarized, and you can see that it is this one, in this case, with a plate above it. And one of the simulators would be horizontally polarized. This facility with plates uh, on each side. From the very beginning uh, of actual progress on Trestle, it was a bit of a disaster. Uh, I was reading an official history of it commissioned by the Air Force, which was kind of notable for just how critical the author continuously was of McDonnell Douglas aircraft and their performance on the contract. Uh, I don't necessarily, you know, want to spend 30 minutes discussing the many faults of McDonnell Douglas, but this project was over budget, over schedule from basically from the very beginning, and the Air Force Special Weapons Laboratory was constantly upset. Uh, McDonnell Douglas kept making changes to the design without getting approval. Uh, 
There was a strong feeling that McDonnell Douglas lacked an attention to detail and had a tendency to just kind of ignore defects in the plan by sort of pretending that they didn't exist. So there's a long story of issues with the design and construction of Atlas I, and those issues led to changes. One of the biggest changes was the complete elimination of one of the two Atlas simulators. For budget reasons, the vertically polarized facility was dropped, and a decision was made by the mid-70s to build only a horizontally polarized facility, which would ultimately go in the location originally planned for the vertically polarized facility, simply because construction there was somewhat cheaper. Now, to help you understand how this works a little bit better, uh, this is sort of a side view illustration of Trestle. Uh, this illustration was actually to describe the, the fire suppression system, because uh, obviously this being an enormous all-wooden structure with an aircraft on it, fire was a real concern, but it gives us uh, a cutaway view of the design of the simulator. You can see that the test volume is located here on top of the platform. The pulsers were located at the far end of the device, which fired uh, an electromagnetic pulse, through the test area into a terminator, which was located at the top of a tower. The terminator was placed at the top of a tower so that the converging feed lines approaching it would not interfere with being able to directly taxi an aircraft out onto the test area. They really wanted this facility to be quick and easy to operate so that they could use it frequently. The entire structure needed to be manufactured of wood so that it was dielectric and would not interfere with the shape and behavior of the electromagnetic field. Because of this constraint, a trestle is often referred to as the largest wooden structure in the world. Uh, I'm not sure that anyone is completely sure how true that is, but trestle uh, is manufactured almost purely of wood. I say almost, uh, you know, some of the people who like to call it the world's largest wooden structure might be a little upset by this fact, but there was actually some metal used in the construction of trestle. Specifically, some small metal rings were used uh, as part of reinforcing joints. Those metal rings had to be small enough that they would not substantially interact with the magnetic field. They also all had to be oriented a certain direction. So th there is some metal in this structure, but it's quite minimal. This photo taken during construction shows you uh, how the actual platform was built of heavy wooden beams placed on top of a wooden structure. This object that we see off at the end is called the wedge, and the wedge is actually part of the ground plane uh, for the facility. It helps to uh, prevent reflections and shape the field so that uh, it isn't reflecting off of and interacting with the actual pulsers and feed lines. The pulsers would be located, one each, on these two platforms into the feed lines, which are not yet present as of this photo. If you look in the wooden deck, you'll notice these. This really emphasizes the need to make this structure almost entirely of wood. Those are actually wooden bolts. Uh, here's a photo from a report on trestle of the nuts on the end. The nuts and bolts used in the assembly of trestle were made of a type of plastic impregnated plywood. Uh, obtained from a, a very specialty manufacturer. They were really kind of a hassle. Uh, they needed to be tightened almost continuously, and Trestle, because it was this enormous wooden structure with fairly exacting demands, in general was just very high maintenance. A history of the facility mentions that there was a staff of six full-time individuals who they called wood technicians, who basically spent their whole day tightening nuts, resealing wood, uh, and just doing basic work to keep the structure in good condition and sound. Trestle underwent many, many design modifications under its construction, and uh, one of the funny missing details is that it's not actually especially clear when Trestle first became operational, but around 1980, so something like 11 years after the effort was first started, Trestle finally reached a functional stage as a horizontally polarized plate-type confined EMP simulator with a wooden platform raised 130 feet off the ground, which was capable of supporting an aircraft, allowing an aircraft to be tested in its flight configuration and in a field which was consistent with, with that which would be encountered in flight. 
Here is the photo of what all that effort added up to. This is a B-52 bomber, one of the uh, most important uh, test objects actually placed on Trestle for testing. There's a couple interesting things to pick up from this image. Uh, one is that the B-52 bomber is really a rather tight fit on Trestle's 200 by 200 foot platform. During the design stages of Trestle, they actually conducted some experiments uh, to determine whether or not the platform was even large enough to do this. The B-52 is not capable of taxiing itself onto the platform and turning around. Instead, they taxied the B-52, and then as I understand it, they basically lubricated the deck and then used a tractor to pull the tires skidding sideways so that they could rotate it. Uh, they performed this experimentally somewhere in the Northwest, just to confirm whether or not it was actually possible to do it. Uh, this whole thing allowed them to rotate the B-52 in an area of under 100 feet across, so that they could position it on the platform, and then expose it to fields. This is the ramp, which leads back to the taxiway, which is at the higher ground level. And then this is basically a service bridge, which connects the test platform to the wedge, which contains the pulsers, as well as the instrumentation, control electronics, etc. You can see here the substantial and bulky construction of the support uh, for Trestle, which is this heavily reinforced and extensive grid underneath the platform, including sort of these buttress features. All of this was modular. Much of it was constructed uh, somewhat off-site and then lowered into place in the form of these large sections, which were referred to as vents. Each one was basically positioned and then bolted to the next using those uh, rather unusual uh, wooden uh, bolts and nuts. Uh, Trestle received, in the context of these simulators, fairly heavy usage. There's not a lot of detailed information on everything that was done with Trestle, uh, but this list is somewhat complete. You'll notice the B-52 bomber uh, was an earlier object tested. Uh, 78 and 79, there was apparently testing of the E-3 and E-4. Uh, those were aircraft directly related to nuclear command and control. The E-3 was more of an early warning system. The E-4 was more of an airborne command post. That's kind of funny because I said Trestle seems to have been commissioned in 1980. This is one of many confusing things about the history of Trestle. It seems like it probably received some use uh, before its formal commissioning event. Uh, also included on the list are the Tomahawk uh, and the B-1, uh, some fighters, and the E-3A, EC-135, and E-4B, which all kind of fit into this world of nuclear command and control. It is not clear when the last use of Trestle was, but it does seem to have been in the late 80s time period. This is a photo of Trestle, which was taken from off to the side of the ramp. We can really get a view here of the scale of the Trestle wooden structure. Uh, it's really an enormous thing. It's still clearly visible from above, and if you're ever uh, flying in or out of Albuquerque, there, there's a good bet that you'll see a fairly good view of it, especially if you're heading anywhere south, since aircraft are often uh, departing runway 8 and then taking a, a southward turn on the go. So having talked about the history of all of these simulators, let's talk a little bit about their fate and where, uh, where they ended up today. Uh, and now we can take a look at more modern imagery, so we'll get a little bit of a contextual view in, uh, in Google Earth. Here is the bulk of Kirtland Air Force Base, and of course you can see the, the Sunport Airfield uh, off in, uh, in the west side. Just south of the airfield, Alex remains quite, sim uh, quite visible today. In fact, the Alex simulator is largely intact. Uh, I used to have occasion to actually drive along this road that you can see to the south here, and following that road you can get a, a fairly good view of Alex. So if you have Air Force Base access and they ever resume use of the south gate, then try to take the excuse to head out via the south gate and, and get a view of Alex. Uh, off to the side of the road. VPD-1 is now uh, largely gone. They actually demolished the antenna. You can see it appears that the uh, gas switch concrete pad is still located there. Uh, I'm not sure if the underground structures remain, but given that they demolished the antenna, I guess they probably filled them in. The original pad, which was used by VPD-1, 
uh, as well as suspended RES and HIS-1 uh, is still there and I believe is used for weapons loading and arm de-arm uh, today. The Air Force Base Control Tower, of course, is no longer located here, but now on the north side of the field, so it's not quite such a big area. I think there's very little demand for space in this part of the airfield currently, which is part of why Alex has been able to remain so intact. Now let's move over to the east, as the dog starts barking again, and take a look at the eastern complex of simulators. VPD-2 and HPD remain largely intact. Uh, VPD-2, as far as I can tell, is entirely intact, with the odd exception that a, uh, I believe that's a motorcycle safety course uh, pattern has been painted on its original ramp. Uh, HPD, the towers are there, however, the actual antenna has been removed. I suspect it did not hold up very well to the weather, and if it wasn't brought down intentionally, uh, one of the wind and hail storms we got probably took it out. To the south, Ares has also been partially dismantled. Uh, I believe the support towers for Ares are gone. You can still see some of the original Ares buildings, and the ramp which leads to the underground area where the uh, parts of the pulse generators were located, as well as some instrumentation, is quite clear. And then... The most impressive of all of them, Atlas, is also quite intact today. Now, at least Atlas uh, or Trestle, and perhaps some of these other facilities, is now part of the Manhattan Project National Historic District, which should give it some sort of preservation. Uh, however, I don't believe there are any plans at this time to enable public access to the Manhattan Project Historical District uh, sites, which are on Kirtland Air Force Base. I'm hoping there will be some progress in that area, but I haven't heard anything. Just to look over the parts, we can see the wedge, which is located here on the south end, the actual test platform, the ramp, and then the tower, which supported the Terminator, and the towers, which supported the actual uh, feed lines and plates, are also intact. You can see that uh, trestle and VPD-2 and HPD are still connected to the airfield by a taxiway. However, that taxiway is not maintained in good condition today. Uh, I don't believe that there was any use of these facilities after around the year 1990, uh, and they've basically been in mothballs since then. Trestle does have a somewhat amusing story, uh, which is that until around 2009, I believe, an army program called Big Crow was using the former uh, workspace and instrumentation room under the wedge as their offices. This is a bit amusing because the Army Big Crow program ended up embroiled in controversy when I believe three or four of its leaders pled guilty to fraud charges. Uh, it turned out in 1999 the Big Crow program was defunded, and then its remaining members basically continued operating it as a scam to, as far as I can tell, keep receiving their salaries to do nothing. They were uh, getting things like Air National Guard wings to pay for Big Crow, but then the money that they received, they were using to hire lobbyists to get more people to pay for Big Crow. So it, it's just kind of amusing to me that there was this weird bit of, uh, of fraudulent, undying army project that was basically hiding out in the basement of the abandoned uh, EMP simulator. Now one might wonder, Given that so much effort was spent in the construction of these enormous facilities in the late 60s and through the 70s, why is it that they largely only saw a little over a decade of service? Well, you know, I think that's kind of a complex question, and I don't know that I can give all of the answers, but I can offer a few answers. One very general one is that, you know, going into the 90s, the Cold War was trailing off in many ways, and I think there was just less of an appetite for uh, huge expenses in order to develop uh, nuclear-hardened uh, military equipment. Another reason is that the computer simulation technology improved, and I think that uh, as computer simulations got better, there just wasn't a feeling that there was as much of a need to perform actual physical simulations of EMP. And the third reason, and the reason which is most specific to EMP devices, uh, reflects a little bit the issues I mentioned with Alex and VPD-2 
being located very close to the airfield and to the control tower. And that was ongoing safety concerns related to these simulators. As I understand it, it is still not very well known today whether or not there's a substantial environmental health and safety hazard involved with these simulators. Certainly in the early 90s, it was not. And several groups of people actually fired, filed several lawsuits uh, against the Department of Defense for the operation of these simulators on environmental grounds. Uh, and I'm not really sure where those lawsuits ultimately ended up. It's hard to find too much information for them. But I do know that the operation of many of these EMP simulators was suspended as a result of the lawsuits, and I think it may have never resumed after that point. This was happening in 91, 92 uh, sort of time frame. So for how much work went into them, for how much work went into Trestle especially, this was a fairly short-lived uh, little chapter of Cold War history. Uh, Trestle enjoyed its golden age from about 1980 to 1990, and ever since then, it has been largely abandoned, with the exception of uh, a few <laughs> errant army officers who are hiding out there still managing to pull a salary. So that's the story of EMP simulators at Kirtland Air Force Base. As you can see, there's quite a few uh, covering quite a large area of the Air Force Base, and I think it's an interesting little chapter of history. I hope that you learned a little bit, and I hope that you found this interesting. Uh, I really have no idea what I'm doing making these videos, so I think, especially when I start trying to edit this, I'm going to find a whole lot of rough edges on it, uh, and I'm hoping to, you know, get better with time. I'm hoping to make this the start of a series. I think I'll be sticking to the topic of Kirtland Air Force Base for the time being, because it's uh, something which is local to me and something which I spend a lot of time reading about. Uh, and I do think the next video will be discussing, as I had once promised, uh, environmental contamination and remediation. Just to get an idea of the scale of that problem, let's uh, flip on a Google Earth layer. All of these uh, red triangle exclamation marks you see are environmental remediation sites, uh, which are either uh, closed, meaning remediation is complete, or remediation is still in progress. Um, on Kirtland Air Force Base, the sites that are marked right now are just those which are under the purview of the Air Force, uh, under its uh, RCRA permit. I'll talk more later uh, about what that means, but the point I wanted to make is that this is actually an understatement. There are even more than this because there are also sites which are managed by Sandia National Laboratory under an RCRA permit and by the Department of Energy Office of Legacy Management. So there's even more than this. I think we'll just sort of take a tour of these sites, uh, talk about some of the more interesting ones in detail, and uh, talk about the other ones uh, more in terms of categories. Should be interesting, and if environmental contamination and remediation is not something you know a lot about, I'll try to give an overview of both the, the political and regulatory framework, as well as the scientific aspects, the contaminants of concern, the places that they can hide out, uh, and the ways that they are remediated. So keep an eye out for that next video. Thank you so much for watching, and please let me know what you think.